This is the story of a group of friends. I took it to my friend Kevin at like 2 a.m. I called him up at home. He's like, oh, let's do it. I said, I got, you know, we got to make a game console. Of course, Seamus walks in with this, this whole plan. Boom, here's the Xbox plan. So it's like, great. Boy, I remember thinking, what have we gotten ourselves into? Who took on the leader in a billion dollar industry. So he's sitting in a room with Bill Gates and Steve Ballmer, and Steve Ballmer is saying, you're gonna lose all our money! Wow, we better get this right, otherwise it could potentially really screw up the industry. Xbox was the sexiest thing any Microsoft employee had ever heard of ever at the company. They all wanted to work on it. This is it. We're not looking back. I'm waiting for my Xbox. This is the remarkable story of the Xbox. The Xbox begins with the driving force behind it, Seamus Blackley. Seamus grows up in New Mexico and early on develops an interest in the world of gaming. I can remember very distinctly the feeling of playing my Atari 2600 and not really wanting to finish the games or to play them so much, but really wanting to take that excitement that I felt and like write my own games. And, and when I got my, my Apple, my mom likes to tell a story. When they gave me the Apple II for Christmas, I stayed up for 72 hours straight. The moment they gave it to me, it was plugged into the TV, and I, and I, I actually fell asleep like on it the first night because uh, I was so desperate to write a game. Despite his love for games, his career steers him into another direction. I was working as a physicist, and uh, I was doing high-energy physics and there was this giant particle accelerator that was going to be built in Texas called the Superconducting Super Collider in Waxahachie, Texas. And that was, that was my future and everybody else's future who was doing experimental high energy physics in the U.S. at that time. That was, that was what it was about for the most part. And it got canceled. It got canceled by Congress. With no job on the horizon, Seamus applies for a job posting on campus. It was Looking Glass Technologies. They're, they needed somebody to rewrite a uh, car physics model for a car and driver game they were working on. And so I went over there and uh, met all the guys working on Ultima Underworld and, and met the Ned Lerner, who was a, an idol of mine from Chuck Yeager's Flight Simulator in days past. And started working on car physics. And, you know, that grew into the physics system and System Shock and AI stuff and, uh, and Flight Unlimited and, and uh, Underworld 2 and all that stuff. But new management flies into a completely different direction. So, you know, these game guys, you know, we're going to bring in a professional management team. And at the time I was saying, look, we need to do combat version of Flight Unlimited. I really want to do that. And the management decided that instead they wanted to compete with Microsoft Flight Simulator. So I started looking for a job, and I eventually got recruited to go work at DreamWorks. At DreamWorks, Seamus goes to work on a game based on the smash hit movie Jurassic Park by Steven Spielberg. The future looks bright for Seamus, but there are storm clouds on the horizon. So there I did a bunch of stuff culminating in working on Trespasser. Pack Hunter, quite vicious and quite intelligent. Screwed that up pretty well and, you know, didn't do a lot of things that I, I know I would... Uh, I want to do today. I can do this. Trespasser is released in 1998 and its flaws are obvious. Critics and fans are disappointed and Seamus loses faith in himself. Ain't left. You know, after Trespasser, I got death threats. Heavier than I thought. There was a huge backlash. It was the very dawn of fan sites on the internet. It was the dawn of the sort of uh, culture of first person shooters and everybody expected it to be a shooter. I mean, first of all, they expected it to be finished, which it wasn't. But they expected it to be a shooter, and it wasn't. It was really different. So people were really pissed off. I mean, people really hated that game. I mean, there were some people who really loved it, and there were a lot of people who just hated it, and just, I figured that my career was over. It really did. It was an incredibly painful time. And a turning point. Seamus decides to make a change and heads north. And I thought I'd just go hide, go hide at Microsoft for a while. I chose a program manager job in the, in the graphics division because I just wanted to get away from games. But he's not able to resist games for long. In 1999, Sony announces the release of their newest console, the PlayStation 2. 
and enterprising Seamus has an idea. Well, there were rumors of, of Sony, um, you know, releasing this, this, this new version of the PlayStation. That it was going to kill PC graphics outright. And, uh, you know, I've been doing 3D for a long time, and 3D on the PC is unstoppable. I mean, it's just continuously, continuously innovating, continuously feeding back on itself, continuously progressing. And it just seemed ludicrous to me. It became clear to me that, you know, very few companies in the world could do something as bold as take on Sony, and Microsoft was one of them. That it was, became incredibly clear to the other guys that I talked to about it that we had an opportunity to make a game console which had the business potential of a game console, but had the tool support and the power for artists of the PC and of, and of, and of the sort of traditional offline rendering community. And that was really the spark. And at 35,000 feet in the air, Seamus is inspired. So, you know, one night, you know, for whatever reason, I was sitting on an airplane and, and, you know, I got hit by cosmic radiation. And I wrote this thing up and I took it to my friend Kevin at like 2 a.m. after I landed. I called him up at home. He's like, oh, it's a good one. I said, I got, you know, we got to make a game console. Kevin Bacchus, a project manager at DirectX, sees the potential. Initially, there were really four of us working on Xbox. Seamus, myself, uh, Otto Berkus, who ran the graphics development for, um, for DirectX, and Ted Hase, who was my boss, who was in charge of evangelism for DirectX. We obviously went and talked to Ed Fries extensively about what his thoughts would be. Ed Fries, the man in charge of the games division at Microsoft, is immediately impressed. They approached me and said, hey, uh, if we made this console, would you, uh, would you support us? Would you help us get it through uh, upper management? And would you uh, help make the games for us? They were pretty persuasive. They had a plan that, um, that I thought was pretty exciting. The group embarks on a crusade to bring the console to the masses. We had day jobs. We had stuff we were supposed to be doing, right? And we just weren't doing it, right? We were inviting ourselves to meetings. And we thought, God, you know, if they're making a device for the home, it has to be Xbox. It has to be this thing we're thinking of, which at the time we were calling the direct Xbox, which is how it got the name Xbox. The group pushes the idea up through the ranks at Microsoft, eventually reaching the top. Mr. Bill Gates. The first time that we talked to Bill Gates about Xbox, I think he was immediately very taken by the opportunity, by the chance to create something that was technologically superior to anything that was out there, and really focused on a single task. Bill got it right away. I mean, Bill was Bill's a very sharp guy. So he became one of our biggest allies from the beginning. It was just awesome. It was the most awesome sort of you know support ever, and they just kept on pushing it. Bill Gates sends a memo endorsing the Xbox project. For Seamus, Kevin, and Ed, the moment of truth finally arrives. Wow, we better get this right, otherwise it could potentially really screw up the industry. By 1999, the Xbox is a legitimate project. Software giant Microsoft assembles a team to oversee key elements of the Xbox production. Jay Aller came on board to run the development efforts to, to create the operating system for, for the device, the, all the development tools, that sort of thing. And he brought on board a number of people in key positions to kind of round out that group. It was still just a, an internal project at Microsoft that wasn't something that had been officially announced. It was still very much under wraps because they themselves weren't sure they were going to do it. But the very fact that Microsoft was considering coming into the games console market was a big deal. It could potentially be a bad thing if, if, if Microsoft decides they're going to launch like basically a home PC, branded a game console and put a bunch of PC games on it or something like that, which to those guys who are very smart guys at Microsoft but don't have a lot of context in the game business could well have happened. And so we felt a lot of responsibility to be sure that that, that wouldn't happen. And the response from the gaming community is encouraging. When we went out to publishers and developers is that we've been kind of secretly meeting with all these guys for months and months and months, refining the, the idea. You know, what do you guys think about this? Oh, that's a crazy idea. What do you think about that? Oh, that's great. As push comes to shove, Gates makes a historical decision. It was a meeting where Valentine's Day is a month before GDC, and it was a point at which we're going to announce it at GDC or we're going to cancel this project because we're not going to be ready in time. It was just the final time. It's like, look, 
you know, you have to say go or no go now. Starting up a console and spending billions of dollars to enter a new market is a difficult undertaking for any company, even a company the size of Microsoft. So we come into this meeting, it's scheduled to run from four to six o'clock on Valentine's Day. And Bill is just like immediately on the attack. But what do you mean it won't run Windows? Oh, did we forget to tell you that part? And you find yourself sitting in a room with Bill Gates and Steve Ballmer, and Steve Ballmer is right here, like, you know, the sweat standing on his forehead saying, you know, you're gonna lose all our money! And we all have dinner reservations, and we, we're in big trouble because it's Valentine's Day, and we're not home, and the time is going by. And then in the last five minutes, the meeting just like turned, turned around like 180 degrees. And you know, I don't know if Bill and Steve had this planned the whole time. And all of a sudden, they're all looking around at each other. We got to do this. We got to do this. And then they're all getting excited, which is fun to be part of. In March of 2000, Bill Gates stands on stage at the Game Developers Conference and announces what many had already suspected. I'm announcing the Xbox. The modest tagline here is the future of console gaming. This is a, a huge milestone for us. All they have to do now is accomplish everything they said they could. Boy, I remember thinking, what have we gotten ourselves into? You know, it, it once once the product was finally approved and there were absolutely no other reviews or approvals processes. Once Bill Gates and Steve Ballmer said, look, you know, this is it, we're not looking back. Then the really hard work came in. Every assumption that we had, every plan had to be tested. And it was challenging. You have this giant company behind you, Microsoft behind you, right? You get Microsoft like going in a direction, you better be sure it's the right direction. <laughs> Right, so we started feeling like, wow, we better get this right, otherwise it could potentially really screw up the industry. There was a lot of skepticism about, you know, were we really serious about doing this? Was there ever even going to be a console? There was skepticism about whether we would be able to hit our launch date, whether the performance would be what we said it would be, whether it would in fact be easy to program. At every step along the way, there was a constant proving process. We had to show games very early because you know, we needed to demonstrate what the game was going to be. We had to show that it wasn't a PC. You know, we built the system for developers. There was nobody out there who wouldn't tell you the NVIDIA chip was the hottest thing in the world. Nobody. All consoles are essentially computers. There's a processor, there's a graphics chip, there's an audio chip. All the things that you see in a PC are evident in a console, but they're very different. They're very focused on a very specific thing, on gaming. And sometimes it's not what's on the inside, but the outside that counts. In January 2001, the public gets its first look at the controller and industrial design of the Xbox. Of course, we didn't want the Xbox to look uncool, we wanted it to look powerful. We did a lot of design studies. One of the things that enthusiast press was the controller. Some people didn't mind the fact that the, the original controller, which they called Duke, was bigger. But I think to a lot of the gamers, just they just kind of felt that eh, it was just a little too big. And they've subsequently gone with the S-type controller, which they developed for Japan, which was definitely a better. As the launch date approaches, Microsoft's marketing machine shifts into high gear. Microsoft faced this huge dilemma with how they were going to position themselves in the market. Do we brand it Xbox, but you know, do we have Microsoft on the box? Do we use Bill Gates? Is, is Bill Gates liked by gamers, isn't he? So I think they had a huge consumer marketing identity crisis that they sort of needed to address right away. Anticipation builds on November 12, 2001 in Times Square. I remember walking across the street from the WWF place over to uh, the Toys R Us to get ready for the midnight thing. Bill was there and a couple other people. And Xbox is just everywhere. Up on the lights, every billboard in Times Square, all the big electronic signs, and there's Xbox here, Xbox there. And it was just... I don't know, it's one of those kind of surreal moments. At 12.01 a.m., Bill Gates presents the first Xbox to a customer who had been waiting for hours outside. Yeah, it's just one of those moments in your life that you're just glad to be part of. But Seamus has other things to worry about. Well, I was super nervous because I was going to propose to my wife that night. You know, that was that was the thing I was really nervous about. And I had arranged for Bill Gates to hold my engagement ring, right? So he had my engagement ring in pocket. And 
Bill had called me that afternoon and said, you know, what if she says no? Do you have a backup plan in case she says no? And so I'm thinking, God, is she going to say no? Because I had no I had no doubts up until that moment. I was like, oh, no, oh, no, no, no. She'll probably say yes. It'll all be okay. Frankly, compared to that, the launch of the Xbox is almost anticlimactic. You know, for me, the launch was all about getting on my knee and, you know, having the most fabulous woman on earth say she'd marry me. With a successful console launch and an engagement, Blackley has achieved everything he has hoped for. But the fate of the Xbox is far from certain. This is an Xbox! It's number one! With the Xbox successfully launched in time for Christmas 2001, the future of the system now lies in the hands of the developers. Well, I think that the number one thing that we wanted to achieve was for people who got an Xbox to just be blown away. That has to be the ultimate goal, right? You know, we talked to the people in line in New York, and they were really excited about Xbox. The first Christmas, all the hardcore gamers are going to go out and they're going to buy it because they got it. It's new. It's exciting. There's a lot of press about it. They got to see if it's if it really lives up to the hype. But you don't want to take it home and like open it up and and have it. Sit. And that actually happened with a couple of other console launches, right? People got excited about the technology. You take it home, and of course, technology isn't enough, right? It goes on and makes the boot noise, and then you put in a game that's not so great, and you're like, whoa, there went 300 bucks. <laughs> oh, that was awesome. They have to feel incredibly happy about it. The thing sold out everywhere, and it was just, you know, a, a giant success. The real question on any console is how it does in subsequent years, you know, especially the second Christmas. That's really important. That's when, to some extent, the real battle happens. Because everybody has a lot of units out there, a lot of consoles, you know, and the generation of games that come out into that installed base appear. So what happens in the later years is really kind of dependent on the quality of the games. That is, is something that's, you know, just a very magical and very difficult thing to predict in advance. And then it's a real creative contest, right? Then it's, it's not about the specs of the hardware. It's not about how cool your TV campaign is, you know? It's not about any of those things. It's about which games you have and, and are your fans happy or not. So I would argue the real worker is then. If you got a great game and it's only available on Xbox and it's the thing that everybody's excited about, then they're going to go out and buy Xboxes. Microsoft's development team, Bungie, provides the must-have game for the season. Halo was, was awesome. We're not gonna make it! We'll make it. Pull up! Pull up! Played a lot of games in my life, and this is a game I could just sit and play and play and, and have a great time. So, I really felt pretty confident that we were gonna be able to come out and really surprise people. Despite fierce competition, Microsoft manages to sell 1.5 million consoles and nearly 5 million Xbox games by Christmas. Developers take advantage of the console's hardware abilities to create distinct and innovative games. Ah, camera! No, 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 no! That means turn on the lights, idiot! I'd have to say that right now my favorite game is a game from Microsoft Studios that just came out called uh, Kung Fu Chaos. It's a fighting game, but it's kind of a party game. And to see that kind of, of work and craftsmanship going to a game produced for something that kind of we had had an idea about, you know, three years ago, four years ago, it's just you know, astounding. In the fall of 2002, Xbox Live is launched. We've been cooking this thing up very, you know, from the get-go. Three years ago when we conceived of Xbox, we wanted to bring it online. You know, online gaming is going to be the big next step in, in video gaming. And a celebrity event is held. These are always really fun parties. Bring it on. Yeah. Yeah, I'm excited. It's so exciting, and it really improves the hand-eye coordination. Oh! 
It's awesome, man. It's awesome. Super fun. Great games. Realistic. Uh, I think that's off the chain. Yeah, I love this stuff. Gift bag. In my mind, I connect the dots thinking about Xbox. Even as the Xbox continues to succeed, preparations are made for a new system. Go for it! We're deep, deep in planning right now for the next version of Xbox. Is this guy serious? I actually probably spend more time right now when I'm in the office. I probably spend more time right now on Xbox 2 than I spend on Xbox 1, if you can believe that. Whatever! And part of that is because we got to do it right this time. <laughs> We were going to have enough time to make sure that we're not, like, just insane at the end. And that we have the content portfolio really planned out, and we have the games lined up, and that we have this machine that's not only going to be successful in the U.S., but can be successful everywhere in the world. And that, that's what's going on. Although Kevin and Seamus have left to start their own development company, just taking a look back is sometimes the greatest reward. It was a mixture because, on the one hand, it was really, really hard. But on the other hand, I mean, it was probably the best time I've ever had in my life because we were out doing what we wanted to do. I mean, you know, very few times do you get the opportunity to actually see kind of your, you know, a dream that you had come together and so many people come together to make it happen. Like, looking back to, you know, 1999, it's just unbelievable. I went to a Tokyo Game Show, and there were giant Xbox banners everywhere, right? It's unbelievable. And you think back to 1999, think back to me and Kevin and Otto and Ted, these four guys, like, sitting in a room eating jelly beans, you know? Ah, come on. That's a wild ride. That's a really amazing thing. So I guess for me personally, there's that. I, I, I can't really hold it to an absolute scale because it's really emotional. So it's just, uh, yes, it's nearly unbelievable. Xbox is the next generation of video gaming. It's the only control I've ever touched that actually like molds to your hand. Dead or alive, dead or alive. Yeah, that's that pretty cool. I let him play all the time. It keeps him home. It's awesome. It's the best console ever, man. <laughs>